everybody. So for chapter five this week, we'll be looking at Greece. Um, the sort of the pre-Greeks and the Greeks up until, well, generally up until they're conquered by the Romans. So the Greek experience from 3500 BCE to 100 BCE. Excuse me, idea of Greece. We'll be starting down here with Crete, uh, and we'll move our way into uh, mainland Greece. This is all mainland Greece. The Peloponnesus here, it sort of looks like an island. It's not. It is a peninsula. It is actually attached at Corinth here. So it is not a an island. It's part of it is part of Europe. It's part of the continent. We have the Sea of Crete, the Aegean Sea. We're going to talk about Minoans and then Mycenaeans, and then we'll talk about mainland Greece, you know, Athens and Sparta, all of those. Also be aware this is Anatolia, which is sometimes called Asia Minor. Uh, the Greeks, we were referring to the Greeks, we call it Ionia, and that's generally just the coast here. So Anatolia is, is this entire region, it's Asia Minor. And Ionia is in that area. It's it's part of it. So those are all generally the same place as far as we're concerned. All right. Um, geography was very important to the Greeks. Uh, it was a very mountainous area with very few rivers, very fragmented society. Uh, and the central governing unit is known as the polis. We'll talk more about that. So Hellas, the land and the polis, the Hellas, the Greeks. Uh, we really consider the Greek culture sort of the basics of Western uh, civilization, which Western civilization is what, what forms Europe. Uh, and then, of course, out of that comes America. Our art, our politics, philosophy, mathematics, science, uh, all this really comes from Greek beginnings. Greek history is broken up into four periods. Uh, the Hellenic, the Archaic, the Classical, and the Hellenistic. And we're going to talk about each of those. The Hellenic, the Archaic, the Classical, and the Hellenistic, all four periods. So start with this, the Minoans, the Mycenaeans. Uh, Neolithic, that's New Stone Age. Neolithic farming probably began in this period, probably around 6500 BCE uh, in Greece. Um, bronze production started probably around 3500 BCE. This is where we see the first two societies develop. One on the island of Crete and one on mainland Greece. Our first flourishing culture, the one that developed on the island of Crete, that little island you saw on the map a minute ago off the coast. Uh, developed probably around 2000 BCE, uh, and this is named Minoan. Archaeologists named it this. We have no idea what they called themselves. Uh, we know we don't really know much about them. Uh, after this mythical king Minos, uh, trade with mainland populations was probably significant. Uh, there's lots of evidence of back and forth trade in grave goods and archaeological finds between the islands and the mainland. Um, lots of economic opportunities to exchange all kinds of goods. Of course, this is a Bronze Age. So they're exchanging bronze weapons, bronze pottery. They're exchanging, or not bronze pottery, but pottery. Um, bronze weapons, bronze jewelry, uh, cooking utensils, you know, all kinds of things that were bronze. We also know writing developed around this time period. That's why it's history. Writing, they had writing, completely had it, although it is problematic. Um, so this Minoan society really started to flourish probably around 2500, where it became successful, sort of a successful merchant trade empire. Uh, and it lasted till around 1500 BCE. These dates are all approximate. I mean, you understand that. They're, they're circa dates. You know, like I could have a C in front of all of them, you know, which says they're, you know, approximately these dates. Um, social hierarchy develops. We know they had a king. They had nobles. Um, 
We nearly had merchants, probably right towards the top. This is common on island societies. Island societies have to have a big merchant class to survive, you know, to really trade with foreigners, goods, and, and whatnot. The Gnosis, the Gnosis, which is what we call probably this largest structure on the island of Crete, it's an example of a, a massive construction project. Um, this was a very advanced society for the time period. They built complex structures, complex... Um, well, in the case of the Gnosis, it was this massive temple palace complex. Um, it had probably a thousand rooms, uh, featured indoor plumbing, a water system, a sewer system. Uh, in the center was probably a palace of some sort. Uh, could potentially house thousands of people. Uh, it was maybe the entire center of their society was this Gnosis. We know they worshipped gods of some sort. Female goddesses uh, seem to be popular. And there is little evidence of warfare. Little evidence of weapons of war. Um... You know, like you know, like they dig up bones of, of the dead, and they look at whether the bones have chips in them, whether the bones look like they've been struck by struck by swords or weapons. Uh, you know, that's really out of the purview of history, but that that research has been done, and it really has indicated that they they don't seem like they were a warrior society necessarily. Their prosperity seemed to come from trade, and they had the advantage of being on an island. A good sized island with a lot of resources and isolated, you know, hundreds of miles from any other real population. Very protected. Um, the next group we'll talk about are the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans, we call them the kingdom at Mycenae. This is a region, city. Um, this is on the Peloponnesus, this is on that peninsula. Uh, which juts out from Greece mainland. Well, I guess technically it is Greece mainland because it is part of the European continent. They had cities and kingdoms throughout this region. Uh, they grew wealthy. We believe they eventually conquered the Minoans. So even the Minoans were not a warlike people, well, that might have worked to their disadvantage because we know the Mycenaeans were. Mycenaeans were aggressive, warriors, violent. They honored warrior kings. Um, they they probably grew wealthy with trade with the Minoans and realized how successful the Minoans were and how much money was there and and who know who knows what kind of treasures are stored at Gnosis. Eventually, they conquered them, took them over. The Mycenaeans continued to fight. They were led by warrior kings. They were warrior people. Um, we find the first metal armor in the world in Mycenae. That we have any evidence of the first. It, it, therefore, it shows how important bronze was to them. It also shows how important warfare was that they actually took to crafting metal armor, which is very complicated and involved, uh, far more intensive than like making weapons because armor has to be individually crafted for every single person. Uh, it's crafted to fit every individual, so it probably only went to elite soldiers. Kings, warrior chiefs, um, common, regular people, probably even soldiers probably didn't have armor. Uh, we know they built large cities, you know, for the time period, relatively. Uh, large stone walls, and pretty much all grave goods found in Mycenae have weapons. Uh, you know, the idea, I guess, is they take their weapons into the afterlife to fight in the afterlife. Or it's honorary. The weapons are honorary. You know, they died fighting, so the weapon is given to them as an honor. But nonetheless, it is evident they were a warrior society, valued warfare. Um, this is where we see the founding of some very important cities most people have heard of, like Athens or Sparta, Thebes. We see the, the East cities. By 1100, 1300 to 1100, uh, we see um, Greece, which was rich and full of competing kingdoms, constantly warring with each other. And it does appear by 1100, they seem to destroy themselves. Um, they just seem to collapse. And we call this the Greek Dark Age, which I'll talk about next. It's still unclear why this happened. 
Some think they simply destroyed each other. Uh, there's actually some evidence of natural cataclysms, earthquakes. Uh, there's even evidence of maybe some type of, uh, you know, an earthquake can cause a tsunami. And the reality is almost all Greek cities and towns, city-states, were right on the coast, right near water. Which means a tsunami in the Aegean, a tsunami in the Mediterranean, due to a comet strike, meteor strike, or even just a really powerful earthquake, could have potentially wiped out most of the Greek population. Um, another thing is, uh, referring to them killing each other, you may have seen the movie Troy, that Brad Pitt movie. It's actually pretty historically accurate. There's a lot of accuracies there as far as, as, far as Troy was a real city. Um, the, many of the kings listed there were real kings. Of course, Brad Pitt's character, um, uh, wow, well, totally have blanked on what his character's name was. But his character, uh, Achilles, his character is, of course, a mythological a demigod, half human, half god. Uh, that's a good picture of him there, there, right there, you know, hey, Brad Pitt, woo! Um, Troy was a real city, and we have uh, done excavations on Troy, and there's at least 12 layers indicating the city of Troy. Uh, has been built and destroyed, or built, burned down, or uh, abandoned about 12 times, at least, that we've been able to determine. So over thousands of years, there's been at least a dozen settlements there, uh, up into including actually a large city with walls. So Troy's a real place. Uh, and if you believe the stories at all, and usually myth is based on some true facts, some reality, uh, the Greeks made war, and this is over in Ionia. That's that region over in Asia Minor. Um, let's see what else. The Dark Age, from around 1100 to 800, we see the fall of the Minoan, the fall of the Mycenaean civilizations, kingdoms. We have no writing from this period, the Dark Ages. The Greeks basically go back to the Stone Age. For a few centuries, the Greeks are pretty much Neolithic again. They lose the ability to read and write. They don't produce any language. Their cities are mostly abandoned. Their population declines dramatically. Uh, they pretty much regress a uh, thousand to three thousand years into the past. They don't lose everything. Again, they don't lose everything, but it really seems to be that their people lose most modern technology for the time period. However, during this, they do hold on to a lot of traditional stories, a lot of uh, heroic tales of the good old days, the great days, the great power of the Greeks, how the Greeks were, you know, uh, wondrous. You often see this nostalgia, right? Nostalgia for the golden ages. And so a lot of these stories were probably handed down by word of mouth, handed down by poets or bards or troubadours or minstrels, whatever you want to call it. But they're storytellers. And they handed the stories down year after year, generation after generation. Even though there's no writing, they, they did it verbally. Uh, they'd be told around campfires and taverns for centuries. Centuries later, around 700 BCE, or 7th century, which is actually the 600s, 7th century is the 600s, they're actually written down into these tales we have, the Iliad and Odyssey. Uh, these are excellent historical references for... Uh, this earliest period in Greek Greek history. Again, they're mythological tales, they're fantasy tales, they're fiction. But we there's a lot of evidence in there, and there's been a lot of evidence discovered that many of the places they talk about were real. Many of the kings were real kings. Locations, the wars, the gods they worshipped. Even though the gods are mythological, um, they still these are the gods they worshipped. So there's a lot of really good uh, detail in there about what Greek life was like before the Dark Ages, which tells us a lot. Uh, these, are, these are all attributed to Homer, which was a blind poet, which may not even been a real person. It might just be an amalgamation of a bunch of different po poems and stories put together. Homer might have simply been the person who put them all together. You know, today we might call it an editor. Um, we're not really sure, but they do put it together, so. And uh, we get these wonderful stories, the Iliad and Odyssey. And that, that story of Troy, for instance, with Brad Pitt, that's based on the Iliad. That is based on the Iliad. And the Odyssey is, is the story of Odysseus, who is actually a character in the Iliad. 
and um, he is, it's all about his like 20 year travel back home. And he runs into gods and giants and, and all kinds of mythical creatures all on his journey to try to get back home to his wife. The, the Odyssey, two excellent stories, excellent poems, difficult to read, but not very long, actually. Easy to look up on the internet, and they're really interesting. Uh, lots of warfare, lots of violence, lots of uh, other sex, and, you know, it's, it's a good old body tale and violent tale. It's uh, certainly worthy of any really good R-rated movie that we'd have today. <laughs> um, let's talk about the polis. The polis is pretty much the city-state. Um, uh, we see this unique style of, of city-state, and we call it this because it, it, they're individual states, which today the word state would be synonymous with country. But you bear in mind these are countries, if you will, states, that are the size of cities and the surrounding farmland. Literally what you see in this illustration, a city and the farmland around it, maybe a port or two and a couple of small towns. That's it. I mean, some of these city-states were probably a couple of miles across. That's how big they were. Each one was independently ruled, little, little kingdoms we might call them today, but they were independent, each one sovereign, uh, and this is the polis. And this is an excellent photo here from uh, Athens today, Athens, Greece. This became the central political unit in Greece. Each one was unique. Each one had different politics, religion, cultural traditions. It included the city, all the surrounding countryside. The surrounding countryside is the Kora. That's all this farmland, maybe some small towns and villages. And that's where most people lived, was out here, uh, outside of the city. The walls were just for merchants, business people, uh, politicians, the wealthy families, the upper class families. Um, and, uh, you know, religious, you know, religious leaders, priests, whatnot. And, of course, lots of poor people and slaves as well. This really supported the urban population. They had the food out here in the Chora. They had the mines. They had other goods in production out here. The polis uh, was protected by soldiers we call hoplites. Uh, they're the ones that use the, uh, the shield and the spear. That's what they fought was a shield and a spear. Uh, a very long spear, which actually allowed them to fight two rows deep. Because the back row, the spear was so long, the back row could attack over the shoulders of the guys in front. And then, of course, the guys in front have a spear attacking low. So you have a, a spear attacking at head height, a spear attacking at gut level, two rows of spears, double shields. The, the hoplite and their defensive formation was incredibly problematic for anyone fighting the Greeks. They won most of their fights. They were, they were excellent warriors. And they really prided themselves on warrior and competition and fighting. Uh, you know, like, like Athens was a, a polis, Sparta was a polis, and lots with all the others. At the center of the city was the Acropolis. This is the image right here in the Acropolis. It's the, this, in the case of Athens, it's this big raised hill right in the middle of Athens. Uh, but the Acropolis was the center. It was the civic center. It was the religious center, the cultural center of the city. Uh, Athens is a very prominent one. You can see it here, this mountain, this, this hill area in the middle. That's the way they built it that way. It was, it was very defensible. These are basically sheer walls, almost impossible to get up. So, you know, if the city was attacked or invaded, the people would hide behind the walls. If the walls collapsed, they would eventually run up and hide in the polis, and, or uh, hide in the Acropolis, which also, of course, protected the, um, you know, the wealthy, you know, the wealthy and the elite. Temples and monuments and government buildings. And the Agora. The Agora was really the center of the city. It was the cultural social center. The Agora was where the meetings took place, the vendors, the markets. Uh, and it was where all the movers and shakers would be, if you will. Uh, that's where all the fun stuff was. Uh, you know, the place where uh, you could see entertainment and uh, you could buy and sell everything. And, and you know. That kind of stuff. That was the Agora region. Variety of governments we can find in Greece. Um, we see governments, of course, democracy. This was the beginning of democracy, the first democracies in the world, although a little different than our democracies today. Uh, two other popular government types was oligarchies and, of course, a tyranny. 
democracy was much different than it is today, though. It certainly wasn't as um, open and fair as it was, as it, as it is today. Back then, democracy really included maybe 20% of the population. The male citizens. No women, no slaves, no other free people, no foreigners. Uh, you typically had to be born in the, in the, in the polis to even be considered a, a citizen. So, yeah. Uh, maybe 20% of the population, maybe, had voting rights. But bear in mind, that is in a time when in most places, the only person that made any decisions was the king or the emperor or the priests. So you go from a, you know, a, a, a 0. 0.000%, 1%, to 20%. It's actually a massive increase. We see, for the first time in world history, really, an actual population governed by a large number of its citizens that had never happened before uh it was certainly an incredibly step forward really um let's see what else you want to talk about that these were the first democracies and of course our democracy is based on this their democracy loosely based on their democracy oligarchy is rule of the few i don't know if i even have it on there i don't have it on there but you can it's in your book Oligarchy is the rule of a few, the elite, a small group of people rule, supposedly having the best interest of all. Eh, you know, maybe, maybe not. I'm sure it differed. Um, it is probably just about the most successful government in history, really, is the oligarchy. When it works, it works well, usually. It's certainly not as fair as a democracy, but democracy is incredibly rare. Democracy really... After Greece, we don't really have democracies in the world for another 2,000 years, uh, really. Um, so oligarchy is, is pretty successful and pretty common, and it, it, it does do better for a population than, say, a monarchy or, you know, some other type of totalitarian government. Uh, as long as you have a decent number of people, as long as you have a few hundred people making choices the division of power seems to work. And then there's also tyranny. Tyranny is ruled by one, usually, or one or one in one's family. Sometimes it's a whole family with usually one person chosen to lead. Uh, usually in times of war or crisis, and they usually come to power through military might. Tyrannies don't usually last in Greece. They don't. Uh, more often than not, Greece is either some form of democracy or oligarchy. People in Greece don't often like the idea of rule by one person. Um, even if there are certain elite people at the top, they believe many, many elite people should actually have a say in how societies run. Uh, sometimes numbering in the hundreds, sometimes numbering in the thousands. This is a hoplite. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, let's go back to that. Now, as you can see, he has a shield, he has a breastplate on, he has breastplate armor, he has uh, shin guards, you know, in case there's like a sword swung so it doesn't just rip his leg open. He's got some metal guards there on his, his leg, and of course, he's the shield, and he's got that big helmet, and he would have a spear in his hand. The spear is obviously missing from this, this statue. Uh, it could be for a couple of reasons. It might have been made out of wood, or it might have been made out of metal, and someone simply stole it because they needed it to, you know... They simply needed it, so, or whatever reason. Maybe they wanted to take it and melt it down. Who knows? Uh, probably missing a spear. He's poised to strike a blow at an enemy. Uh, this is a Spartan, a Spartan hoplite. You know, what kind of values does this show? What, what in this image do you think the society values based on this? Think about that. Think about military. Think about physical. Think about warfare. Think about what the human body looks like here. Think about that. Like, what is this that shows someone to take the time, the energy, and the patience to, to craft this? What does it mean about a society that they put so much importance on the warrior, the, the prime warrior as well? Um, think about power, how power is embodied in this image. When you look at this... Think about the word power and think about how this image, how this this carving, the statue, really portrays power. 
place yourself in the the, the shoes of uh, the sandals of a Greek from thousands of years ago when they would see this type of image. Think about that. Um, so one of the changes in military tactics connected to the rise of Greece was the ability of infantry. These are infantry. Those are those are men marching on the ground. That's infantry to defeat cavalry. Cavalry are horse soldiers. The Greeks didn't use horse soldiers because, of course, their entire territory is rocky, mountainous. Plus, they everywhere they went, they hopped on ships. So using horses really wasn't a thing for them. Uh, but many enemies did. Many people in Africa, in Asia, in Europe even, used horses. Uh, so how is it that the Greeks were so successfully able to defeat entire armies of horses? Because, I mean, imagine you're standing on the street and there's a car barreling down at you at 50 miles an hour. And you can't move. You're right in front of it. I mean, you know it's going to hit you and kill you. This is the same kind of thing. These horses were well over a thousand pounds. You got a two hundred pound soldier up there with armor and weapons and spears and and just come running at you. So generally speaking, when that happened, infantry would would fold. They'd be crushed by the horses. Greeks no. The Greeks stood firm and the Greeks won. They defeated. Their ability to really be so successful was this hoplite. I mean, how is that successful against horses? What is it that gives them such success against horses, which allow them to defeat so many enemies and become so successful? Uh, think about what I talked about a little while ago, about how the, the Greek soldiers worked in double lines with shields. They're wearing armor. They have two rows of spears. Think about how they could be so successful against, so, against horses uh, coming down on you. Um, in addition, another thing which is significant by the later Greek time period we're going to be talking about, they've discovered iron. So they're no longer using bronze, they're using iron weapons, iron armor, much more strong, durable, um, iron, very tough. I mean, we still use iron today for things. Iron is, you know, I mean, it's tough, uh, very resilient. So think about how iron also made them feel more powerful or gave them an advantage against enemies. So, yeah. You know, you got to think about that. Think about this is actually probably from the Iron Age. This is probably not from the Bronze Age. Uh, he's probably got some iron armor there. The shield might be iron. His 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 chest plate might be bronze. But uh, yeah, just think about how all that really allowed Greece to become so successful. Remember, remember, we haven't talked about it yet. But who is it that comes out of the Greeks? Even though he's not really Greek, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great comes out of these people using hoplites and conquers the freaking world. He creates the greatest empire in history of the world until modern times in size. Uh, no, nothing else compared to it. He, he, his, his empire went from Europe and Africa all the way across Asia. It was massive. It didn't last long, but it was. He did much of this using hoplites. Uh, using this Greek infantry. And he defeated the Persians, which were these horse soldiers. The Persians, the greatest empire before Alexander. So you got to think about how he was able to do all that and how effective it was. There you go. There's your hoplite soldiers all standing with their spears. Very effective. All right. So now we're moving into the Archaic Age. Um, from around 800 to 500 BCE. Two major long-lasting effects of the Archaic Age. Greek influence spreads far and wide outside of Greece. We see it across Europe, Africa, and Asia, uh, eventually conquering, or, well, not conquering Persia yet, but getting into Persia, getting into there. Um, the rise of two very dominant powers, the Athenians and the Spartans, which spend the next couple hundred years at war with each other in varying ways, uh, always striving for power and glory and dominance over the other Greek city-states. Uh, do most mostly due to the fact sometimes this is called the era of colonization as well, do mostly to the fact that Greece itself was mostly not suited for growing crops or food. Greece was rocky, mountainous, uh the greatest food source came from the water, you know, water life, uh fish and crustaceans and everything else. The reality is they didn't have much land for growing farm crops, for expansion. So this is really what leads Greece to, to conquer so much territory all across Afro-Eurasia to do that because they don't have a choice. 
they simply can't stay in Greece. There's no room, there's no place to grow, there's no place to grow crops. So they go in, in search of land and supplies. Greek colonies are established in the Aegean Sea, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the Sea of Crete, widespread Greek culture, which 2,000 years later still influences the entire world, but especially Western civilization. I mean, you ever been to Washington? Look at all this stuff in Washington. It, look at all, you know, the, the Congress and, and the Supreme Court and, and everything we have, all the different structures all across Washington. I mean, our city of Washington is largely based on Greek architecture and Roman, but, but then Roman architecture is simply a copy of Greek architecture, really. So it's really based on Greek architecture. So 2,500 years later, and we're still building things to emulate the Greeks. We are using democracy, which emulates the Greek government. Um, the influence of Greece is so far in reaching that we could spend hours just talking about how it influences modern society in different ways. It's pretty crazy, really. Nonetheless, it is the way it is. The growth of Sparta. All right, Sparta. After an intense 30-year civil war that cost lots of lives, there was intense pressure from common people to make Sparta institute a new government. All right. What this is known as is a Lycurgian regiment. So I'll say that again. Many, many years of warfare in Sparta and its surrounding city-states. Many, many lives lost. Eventually, Sparta was pressured into making peace and making a government arrangement with the neighboring city-states to find some type of peaceful arrangement because the Greeks were simply killing each other. And again, maybe this is what caused the Dark Age. Remember, this is after the Dark Age, but the point being, some people realized that the Greeks were going to destroy themselves again. All right, so this Lycurgian regimen, which gives equal rights to all Spartan citizens. This is one of the things to end the Civil War. Again, Civil War is internal war to where you're fighting amongst yourselves. I mentioned other city-states because what Spartans would do is they would actually pay off or bribe other cities to come and join them. So even though it was an eternal Spartan civil war, other city-states were involved. They were basically brought in as, you know, as paid allies, mercenaries, whatever you want to call it. So to bring peace, and this is on the Peloponnesus, this is that, that peninsula that, that looks like an island, the Peloponnesus. And eventually this Lycurgian system is set up, and what it does is we find citizens, um, some of these allies that join the winning side in this war, become part of Sparta, and everyone who was on the losing side become basically slaves. The helots, I think I have it on here, yeah, the helots. These became the slaves for the rest of Spartan society. So the ones that were on the winning side of this, whenever you know this Lycurgian regiment, this government was set up, the Spartans and their allies were left with citizenship status and power, and um, it really forms an oligarchy of a few hundred elite, powerful families ruling all of Sparta, and it stays that way. And then the helots are everybody else that are pretty much slaves of the rest of the elite. So you got twenty percent or thirty percent at the top. And then everyone else is pretty much slaves or manual laborers working for the Spartans. It was not a fair society at all. Sparta was perhaps the largest slave society in Greece. Uh, Athens had a lot of slaves, but Spartan actually enslaved entire other city-states. Athens just had, you know, slaves, just regular people, usually from warfare. But Sparta went to the point of actually... Uh, enslaving the entire western region of the Peloponnesus was pretty much all slaves for the Spartans. Uh, pretty bad. Uh, and this allowed, this freed up the Spartans to train nonstop. This is how come the Spartans became the greatest warriors in Greece. It allowed the actual Spartan citizens, which is now a military state, after the Lycurgian Regiment is set up, it's an entire military state ruled by military, uh, as a military oligarchy. Um, helots do all the work, and all the male citizens and females train to be warriors. As, as young as age is like five or seven, they start training. Um, they're training to instill the values um, 
of doing with little. You had to learn how to get by with little. You had to learn how to survive on your own. Uh, as you can see here in the image, this pa painting, they actually would train naked. Although I don't believe the boys and girls ever trained together, contrary to this painting. The boys and girls would have probably been trained separately. Um, but yeah, this made Spartan warriors into lifelong Spartan men into lifelong warriors. And even the women trained to fight because the men would be gone away and the women would have to stay back home and protect the home uh, from invaders or even possibly uh, other men that weren't off at war or even from the helots. Because the helots were often known to rise up and try to overthrow Sparta. Never happened. I don't believe the helots ever had a, a really successful uh, overthrow of Sparta, but they tried. There's evidence that they did try. Uh, they even had a saying, the Spartans had the saying, that the mothers would tell their, their sons or the wives, their husbands, come back carrying your shield or on it. Meaning, either come back a winner or die trying. In other words, if you're on your shield, you're being brought back as dead body. So either you win or die trying to win. There is no place for a loser in Sparta. Either win or die. Um, uh, women had quite a lot of authority because the Spartan men were so focused on fighting and training and warfare. Uh, they were often away from home. The boys would be taken away and be gone for years and not come back till they were in their 20s and 30s. And so the women actually had a lot of authority, um, running businesses, running uh, families. We also know, you know, same-sex relationships were common among the men. Um, it was actually, it was actually um, encouraged. The idea being the same-sex uh, homosexual relationships between the men was encouraged. It was standard practice, actually. The idea being, if you you feel and you care for someone, you're you, you're much more likely to fight to the death. So if you love the person or you're intimate and you have feelings for the person you're fighting shoulder to shoulder with, you're willing to die for them. So this made them more effective, potentially. Um, probably true. The Spartans were considered to be the most effective soldiers in Greece. Uh, infantry soldiers in Greece. Greek colonization map. You see Greece here. Um, you see Sparta here on the Peloponnesus. You can see all the places they went. Africa. All across Europe. All across the Mediterranean. Across the coast of Europe. The Black Sea, Anatolia, this is uh, Ionia right here, all the way over to Phoenicia, the Middle East. Uh, yeah, they went everywhere. Anywhere they could get a foothold that they could build a town or community, they would. They usually would start up trade. They would then colonize people from mainland Greece. They would bring people over in ships and set up Greek communities. There were probably 300 of these uh, different Greek city-states outside of mainland Greece. All across the, all across the coasts of this region of Afro Eurasia, but another one of the reasons their culture was so successful, they literally took it everywhere. We see Greek culture invading Northern Africa, Western, uh, uh, all of Europe, Western Asia. Probably one of the reasons that it was so significant and lasted, and is still influencing us today. Talk a little bit more about Athens. So Athens was under similar, or went through similar issues. Uh, internal conflict between the rich and the common landowners. Works out a little differently there. Uh, this results in pressure to make laws for all citizens. The idea being so everyone is subject to the same laws, rich or the common person. Not necessarily the poorest, but the rich or the common, common landowners. Draco... Around 621, he publishes the first Athenian Law Code. This is an effort to answer these cries of the lower classes for more equality for all citizens. His code is very harsh, uh, very unforgiving, required serious punishments for minor crimes. This is where we get the term draconian, very draconian laws, laws that are not fair or just. Uh, also laws that often punish people that have different classes in different ways. In other words, rich people could pay a fine, a poor person could be imprisoned, enslaved, or even executed 
for similar crimes that a, a, a wealthy person would either pay a fine or simply get exiled. Solon was another one. He was another wealthy aristocrat, another one of the leaders uh, of Athens. He was a poet. He wrote poems about the injustices um, of the work on the workers and the farmers of Athens. He he publicly gave speeches talking about how people should be treated more fairly. Over time, he gains the trust of commoners. He gains the trust of even the wealthy. Because he himself was one of the leaders of Athens, so he was one of the wealthy. In 594, he was elected as an archon. An archon is pretty much like the chief, the chief governing person in a city. Um, in essence, the leader of Athens, the figurehead for Athens. He immediately frees all people from debt slavery, one of the most common ways of becoming a slave. Today, you get a bad FICO score. In ancient times, if you couldn't pay your debts, you were often enslaved. Uh, he institutes new forms of government, which allow common people to vote in an assembly, which is the governing body. And this assembly involves hundreds, eventually even thousands, of free citizens. This is the beginnings of democracy, a way to keep the peace between the wealthy and the commoners. The ideas and efforts of Solon really influenced the transition of Athenian government, which was probably closest to an oligarchy at the time, into a democracy. Bear in mind this democracy didn't include women, didn't include slaves, didn't include other non any other free citizens, um, foreigners, often referred to as metics, M E T I C uh, S, metics. Um, they were foreigners that lived and worked in Athens, traded in Athens. They were given rights and responsibilities, even sometimes had to serve in the government or serve, or pardon me, not government, serve in the military. But they couldn't vote because they were not natural born citizens. What it did do was it allowed all citizens to vote. Remember, it's at 20% free male citizens uh, to vote. Uh, but think about this. The way it worked is the government would meet during the day, during the middle of the week. Who can go and spend all day voting on laws and debating and discussing the positions and the policies? Regular people can't. Even if they legally can, even if they're free male citizens, they got farms to run, businesses to run lives to take care of. They can't spend all day on the Acropolis up there arguing and debating and voting on laws, etc. So ultimately you have a society which has this 20% which can participate in politics legally, but only really a couple percent of people actually participate. Typically only the wealthy. So it's a government that has the appearance of being a democracy but it is still, in some ways, effectively an oligarchy at this time because many, many people simply didn't have time to go do it. The rich and wealthy did because they had servants. They had slaves taking care of the farms, uh, that kind of stuff. So we do see some created representative offices eventually. Eventually, we see some uh, reforms instituted where they have some elected officials, they have multiple councils, multiple assemblies, um, they have a court system, and eventually they do actually start paying people to do these jobs. And that really does create, by probably the, you know, 400s, early 500s, a real democracy when we get a situation to where almost anyone can actually be part of the government because it's an actual paid job now. It even goes so far as to they create a lottery system, which goes through all the male citizens, which means if you are a male adult citizen, you are eventually, assuming you, you live a decent lifespan, you're going to become part of the government, whether you want to or not. It's simply required. However, by the time they do this, you're, it's a paid job, 
I'm not saying it's a great job. I have no idea what the pay was, but it's a paid job. So this does really create the world's first democracy. It only lasts for, oh, at least in its best form, it only lasts for maybe 100 years uh, in its best form. But it is really the basis of our government, our modern American government. Uh, this idea of the people, elected positions, these jobs, and uh, citizens actually making the laws. Now, in America today, we really don't have a democracy exactly. We have a more of a representative republic, really. Sometimes called a representative democracy. Sometimes. So that is Draco there. That's a, that's a bust, I guess. That's just the head of Draco. And this here is supposed to be Solon. Uh, the beard was a sign of wisdom. You know, the most wise men always wore beards to signify their wisdom and their authority. These are probably marble. So again, we see, uh, as a refresher, you see the images here. We talked about uh, Minoan uh, Crete. We talked about Gnosis. talked about the Mycenaeans before the Dark Age. Then we get into more uh, contemporary Greece, into this, you know, this archaic period, and we're about to move into the classical period. We have Ionia, there's Troy, there's Athens, there's Sparta. The classical period is much more violent. It's hard to say, it's hard to believe, really, almost oh, more violent. But I thought they were always at war. They were. They were always fighting at war, and there was always something going on, but the classical period is even worse. Now they're not just fighting amongst themselves, they're also fighting the greatest empire in the world, Persia, uh, nonstop for years. So this is classical Greece we're going to talk about next, circa 450 BCE, includes all of this. Now, Macedonia is iffy. Some historians don't include Macedonia as part of Greece. Uh, Culturally, ethnically, it is it's questionable. Uh, their culture was similar to the Greeks, probably Greek culture, but also they may simply have had that similarity to the influence of their local, very influential Greek neighbors. Again, you could find Greek culture like you see in Macedonia and Anatolia, in Northern Africa, in the Eastern Caribbean, the Middle East. Anyway, this particular book, it chooses to include Macedonia as sort of part of this classical Greece. Eh. Fine. It's fine. But, yeah, some might not agree with that. Some don't see Macedonia as Greek. Matter of fact, Macedonia hadn't, con and that's where Alexander comes from, hadn't actually conquered the Greeks and spread Greek culture, Hellenism, across the world, we might not consider Macedonia even very significant. All right. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and start talking about culture and philosophy. Thought and culture in the classical period, 500 to 338 BCE. It's called the classical period because the Greeks reached their highest level of cultural, architectural, uh, political, philosophical achievements. While simultaneously, it is probably the era of their greatest warfare, as they fought the Persians and themselves. You know, we see sort of this, we saw in China as well, this idea that during the greatest era of conflict is also the greatest golden age of intellectual achievement. Maybe for the same reasons. Um, people looking for an alternative, an answer to all the violence, an escape. Uh, Technology is, is an issue, too. Um, during warfare in modern times, technology often takes a surge, where in periods of warfare, uh, a lot of technological innovations come out of military technologies. Anyway, variety of reasons. The deadly conflicts. Well, the Persian Wars, uh, really there's two wars here, two Persian Wars. 479 to 4, 499 to 79. These are confrontations between the Persians and the Greek city states, typically happening in Ionia. This is Ionia, which is in Asia. You know, Ionia over there where Troy is. Uh, probably starting around 499. Uh, the, Greeks the Greeks actually rebelled against the Persians. 
Persians thought they were going to form an alliance with Athens of some sort. Athens denies them. Uh, Persia shows up. Uh, Athens uh, helps the Ionians try to fight back against the Persians. And then we see sort of the beginnings of war here between the Greeks and the Persians. The Greeks defeated the Persians in the Battle of Marathon outside Athens around 480. So we see this Battle of Marathon. I have 480 in my notes. And then this slide says 490. So. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to go with 480. That same year, the Persian king Xerxes leads a massive invasion of Greece. This is the movie 300, if you have seen that movie. This is this massive invasion of the Persians, led by Xerxes. Uh, the Persians were victorious. The Persians actually won that battle, that 300 battle, for instance. They killed them. But it was still very successful. The defenders were fighting against an army ten times bigger than them. Um, Athens is eventually defeated as well, conquered by the Persians. Part of it burned down. And then uh, a few months later, there's the Battle of Sal Salamis. The Battle of Salamis. And in that battle, the Persian navy is defeated. This Persian navy which is invading. So the Persian infantry soldiers and horse soldiers were able to roll over the, the, the Greeks, uh, defeat the Greeks, actually capture Athens. And then the navies of other Greek city-states and the Athenian navies actually fight back and defeat the, the Persian navies. Um, and then there's also a battle at Plataea. Uh, battle of Plataea. Uh, this is a victory by the Greek army. And this really ends the war in 479 with a Greek victory. So the Persians win for the first many years. But... They were trying to fight an enemy that was thousands of miles away. Very difficult terrain. And they finally get there. They run into a superior Greek navy. And they get sort of bogged down in Greece. And the Greek uh, city-states rise up against them. And eventually defeat the Persians. Now, they don't defeat the country of Persia. This massive state, which, which co co covers a big chunk of Central Asia. No. All they do is push the Persians back out of Greece. That's all they really do. Now, afterwards, Athens leads decades-long war against... Again, I'm not, not really to the Peloponnesian War yet. Athens leads decades-long war against Persia uh, in the 460s, in the 450s, in the 440s. They, they go to war against Persia constantly, actually taking the war to them. They try to push the Persians out of Ionia. That peninsula area uh, over there uh, in Asia, they try to push them out of there. They eventually form a league known as the Delian League. Um, the uh, the Spartans, I don't have it on the slide here, but the Spartans form their own league known as the Pelopen Peloponnesian League. Sounds right. I think that's what it was. So you have the Delian League led by Athens, the Peloponnesian League led by, um, I'm not sure if that's the name of the, the, the league. Sounds right. Anyway, there's another league led by the Spartans. And they're competing with each other while simultaneously trying to fight the Persians. What might be most amazing is they didn't just destroy themselves. They didn't just kill off each other. The Persians come in and clean up the mess and just take over Greece. Never happens. But could have, potentially. The Delian League, though, makes everybody in their enemies because they pretty much enslave or subjugate any other Greek city-states in eastern Greece, while Sparta does the same thing in western Greece. So they pretty much split Greece between them, Athens taking many Greek city-states as either allies or subjects or slaves, and Sparta doing the same thing. And so for the 460s, 450s, 440s, we have Athens, Sparta, sort of, it's not all that war. They're jockeying back and forth for control and authority in Greece and the surrounding waters. Because trade was huge. For instance, Athens' trade was probably their biggest revenue. They had a lot of silver mines, too. And Athens, again, Athens led the Delian League here. 
Then in the 440s, they form a treaty. Athens and Sparta realize it is in their interest to stop trying to destroy each other. Go figure. And to actually concentrate on generating wealth and power themselves and stop fighting each other. And that lasts for about 15 years. Until eventually it leads to a war. A real, full-on war. All the back and forth in the mid-400s. It wasn't a full-on conflict. It was skirmishes. It was political confrontations. It was trade negotiations. Uh, competition, probably more than war, between Athens and Sparta. Then they have that 15-year break from about 445 to about 430, 431. Uh, and again, they're they're trying to concentrate on Persia, too. They're trying to push Persia back because Persia is a constant threat. They never know when Persia's going to invade again. Uh, and so they're trying to push Persia back as well, going back and forth to each other. All right. All right. Soldiers die in large numbers, fighting against the Persians, fighting against each other. Eventually, Athens joins with Sparta for a while to agree to try and defeat Persia. Eh, that doesn't really... Again, Persia's not defeated. That eventually collapses, um, and they go to war with each other in 431. This is known as the Peloponnesian War. This is the war between Athens and her allies, and Sparta and her allies. This is the Great Greek War, to where almost all Greek city-states participate on one side or the other to destroy each other. Why? Oh, wow. We're still not entirely sure. The, the best reason seems to be over money. Really seems to be over money. The biggest source of revenue for Greece was trade, overseas trade. And Athens controlled the trade. Athens had the biggest chunk of the trade routes. They had thousands of ships. You know, they had military ships, but they also had all these merchant ships. And that seems to be the biggest issue um, and Athens continued to try and dominate and subjugate all other city-states. And Sparta, of course, would have none of that. Sparta refused. And I think what really forced Sparta's hand, because Sparta actually forms an alliance with Persia, if you can get that shit. Sparta forms an alliance with Persia to actually help defeat Athens. Um, enemy, my enemy is my friend kind of thing, right? It seems most likely that what really caused it is Athens' imperialism, creating this massive empire, their constant quest for expansion and power and money and uh, more territory, and Sparta feeling they simply had to fight back. Because at some point, if they just keep letting Athens go, they would eventually become too powerful to defeat, and eventually Sparta would also fall to the Athenian. This is an empire. This was a real Athenian empire. This is the first real Greek empire. Uh, the Delian League under Athens. Uh, eventually, this bloody conflict, which lasts for almost 30 years, ends in 404, involves just about every Greek city-state. And Sparta does win. Athens loses. It's a narrow victory. It takes years for this to really pan out. Uh, truthfully, Everybody lost. This was a massive war that lasted for decades, raging across all of Greece, that really decimated the entire Greek population. We don't know how many Greeks died, but I, I've read, you know, estimates 20, 30% of the entire population was killed. All in the name of glory, power, money, whatever. It's, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's a meaningless waste of life which has dire repercussions for the Greeks uh, in a few years. Nonetheless, eventually Sparta wins, and both city-states are heavily weakened by this. Uh, Greece is never able to recover from this. Really. Not by itself. There's two very well-known Greek writers, historians, that really traveled all across Greece and Persia, both during and after this period, they collected stories, tales of valor and combat, along with mythological stories, some. Most of their stories came from word of mouth, first-hand accounts of battles and cities from both sides. We see stories in here of Spartans, 
Athenians, Persians, and other city-states. Um, these were the first real histories written in Western civilization. They give an objective account of the battles. Okay, no, nothing's perfect. Nothing's totally unbiased. But close to being unbiased. A very objective account from both the Greek and the Persian side. History for the sake of history, we would say. No religious ideologies, no political leanings. They also do some amazing stuff. They generally leave the gods out. Not completely, but most of it is fact-based, interview-based, uh, on people and places they went and visited and things they saw with their own eyes. That's generally what historians do now. Pretty unusual. For this time period, very unusual. And we, we think of Herodotus as the father of history, as a father of, of, of the, the study of history, as the first historian, at least in Western civilization. This gives you an idea where some of the battles are. Plataea, Salamis, which is 480. There you go. Marathon was 90. Salamis was 480. Thermopylae, Artesium. Remember, this is Ionia over here. This is Persia over here. So Persia invaded over land, all the way over here, all the way over here, invaded all into northern Greece. All these battles. They also brought over navies and ships with all kinds of soldiers. Uh, you know, the stories talk about a million Persian soldiers, a million Persian army. I'm sure they didn't have that. Maybe a couple hundred thousand soldiers. Maybe. Uh... You know, no one knows for sure. There was some neutrality here. We see a little bit. But most Greek city-states were involved in these wars. This is the Persian War. Persian Wars here. Here's the Delian League. You can see the Delian League was growing massively. They had the entire west coast of Ionia, the Black Sea, uh, the southern coast of Europe here, much of Greece, the islands. All of this. They created an empire. This was a Greek empire, the first Greek empire under Athens. And Persia felt really threatened by it. And really what got it going was the fact that Athens started pressuring Megara right here. And I think Corinth as well started pressuring them to join them. Well, Megara and Corinth were actually allied with Sparta. So that might have been the match that really lit the fire. When Athens, in, in essence, were pushing and forcing other city-states that were allied with Sparta to change their alliance to Athens. And Sparta felt maybe this was just too much. Uh, because eventually, what's going to happen, eventually the Athenian armies are going to march into Sparta and say, you're our subjects now, obey or be destroyed. So Sparta felt it didn't have a choice. Athenian arts in the age of Pericles. So Athenian arts in the age of Pericles. This is that period in the mid 400s uh, before, um, yeah, it's a period in the mid 400s before the Peloponnesian War. So even though Athens lost the Peloponnesian War, art, culture, philosophy, politics, all that that resulted. Uh, and the dominance of Greece for so long, it's still probably the greatest lasting legacy of Greece. The Athenian leader Pericles, well, this was, let's see, he lived from 494 to 429. It was an elected position, this position of Archon. He led Athens through all the years of warfare with Persia, and even the beginning of the Peloponnesian War before he himself was struck down by plague, which had actually overtaken Athens in 429. He established many of the classic buildings of Athens following the Persian Wars, including the Parthenon, which you see right there, which still stands in Athens today, Parthenon. This was a huge temple complex dedicated to the goddess Athena, who was the patron goddess of Athens, along with other priests, uh, pardon me, other gods, other temples. It was a massive structure, had multiple temples, uh, places to pray, pray and meditate and do rituals and sacrifices, animal sacrifices. 
This was many, uh, many of the one of many of the structures built to celebrate Athens' victory over Persia. They also built the Great Acropolis. You'll see that on the next slide, uh, with great temples and brightly colored bridges and large statues. It is interesting. If you look at Athens and like Rome and Athens today, everything just white. It's just white and marble. You know, you look at the classic architecture. It wasn't that way back then. We actually believe the way it looked at the correct time period was like a rainbow. Think of a circus. Everything was colored and painted in reds and blues and yellows and greens and, and every other color. Uh, like the whole color of the rainbow, all this marble. So they put up this beautiful marble, which today we love to look at. Uh, because it's just so beautiful and pristine. Back then, they would have slopped paint over all of it to make it look that way. This structure was was the greatest uh, marble structure ever made. Uh, it was, you know, I don't have it in my notes, but it was some crazy thing, like 50,000 tons of marble or something, uh, this massive structure. Just incredible. Uh, Athenian culture included the development of drama as well. And we think where our modern theater comes from. There it is. That's where it really comes from. It comes from Greek theater, the creation of uh, tragedies and comedies in Greek theaters. These plays would be performed all across Athens. They were paid for typically by patrons, rich elites. Um, and yeah, I haven't heard in the book. There's a lot more information about this in the book. You can really see a lot more about this there. They often depicted warfare, death, tragedy, and even comedy. Even comedy. Uh, people love them. It appealed to all classes, rich or poor, citizen or foreigner, uh, male or female. The great theaters, the great drama plays. Some of the greatest uh, uh, theater playwrights, I guess, was Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Aristophanes. Um, these playwrights wrote tragedies, which usually dealt with personal issues, the gods, um, political ideas. Very often had a, had a sort of a similar thread to where people brought disaster upon themselves through their foolish actions and selfishness. It's the real world. <laughs> I mean, really. Uh, people do foolish things. Of course, in the Greek tragedies and comedies, they usually resulted in catastrophic, usually whole families wiped out. The fall of states uh, usually resulted in death and disaster. Uh, you know, it's what happens when you freak with the gods, right? When you screw with the gods, you kind of, eh, you know, you don't want to piss off God. You know, you don't. You know, they, you know, Zeus, you know. Strike you down with a lightning bolt or whatever. You know how that goes. Uh, these stories often involve humans being tricked by the gods or controlled by the gods. Uh, there was the famous story of Oedipus. Oedipus where uh, Oedipus is tricked into killing his own father, marrying his own mother. Yeah. Uh, all because of the gods and the idea of humans being arrogant and power hungry. And, and it's just... Yeah, people love these stories. I mean, the the Greek the Greek tragedies and dramas were so, yeah, they were just incredibly popular for everyone, and that is a another huge legacy of the Greeks. Drama and theater is part and parcel of American culture today. I mean, every high school has a drama program. Uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, we have theaters and drama. I mean, Shakespeare, we wouldn't have Shakespeare if it wasn't for Greek drama. Uh, you know, make sure you understand Shakespeare is from, you know, England, you know, 2,000 years later. But the point is, Shakespeare is, is a, it's a, it's really a result of Greek tragedies and Greek theater. So, yeah, uh, the influences upon uh, Western culture are many, many. Uh, even talking about just simply theater here. This is the Acropolis of Athens. There is the uh, Parthenon, that, and inside it was the temple to uh, Athena inside it. Pretty incredible. And, you know, look at the modern city today, the modern city of Athens just growing all around. Think about this image, and I want you to think about what it means. Going back a couple thousand years, what is the, uh, how to put it, 
displacement of the Parthenon, so prominent, looking out over the entire city of Athens, which was at the time the greatest empire the Greeks knew about. They had fought off the Persians. They were challenging the Spartans. They had no rivals, no equals in the Athenian mind. And really, honestly, they were incredibly powerful, whether it was monetary, the prosperity Athens had, uh, the big navy they had, the money. They really were quite prosperous and powerful. So think about how this building the Parthenon by Pericles really reinforces this. Uh, think about where all the money came from. Because the Parthenon, 50,000 tons of marble or something. I mean, think about how expensive it had to be to get it and cut it and quarry it and shape it and the architects, the engineers, uh, the construction workers, the slaves, the, the cost of it took years to build. All of that is with money that's what we would think of as taxpayer money, money that was actually put up and paid for by the citizenry. So what did they think of it? What did you think they thought of the Parthenon and its placement and what it symbolized? Um, how it sort of demonstrated the power and the might of Athens in this time period, the greatest marble structure ever built. Um, or the waste, the waste of money, time, effort, wealth. Uh, did it just show hubris, arrogance, foolishness? Was Should there have been a Greek tragedy written about the Greeks building the Parthenon? I mean, you know... Um, uh, how does this really also symbolize the difference between a place run by a king and a democracy? Uh, because, you know, the people let this be built. The people built this. Uh, many, many people put time and labor and money into it. Uh, much of the wealth of Athens was in the hands of the citizens, uh, the male citizens at least. You know, think about that. You know, how does, you know, the history of Greek, sort of how the histories use the Acropolis, how does it also reflect Greek culture and Greek politics? The fact that what the Acropolis represented, you know, it was this fortification, a place of religion, a place of government. Uh, you know, if there were priests, you know, where did they, you know, they, they stayed there. Um, and how is it also similar to other places? You know, to like a king's castle, or this is before there are castles and stuff, but still it's the same idea. The idea of a monarch ruling from a central location with a king and a castle and castle walls. So how can you see the similarities there? Maybe how this even, maybe this even inspired those types of things later where they would build castles and put walls all around them. Uh, because, I mean, look at this. These had natural walls all around it where no enemy could get up those walls. Plus, the city itself had walls all around it. Um, it's very interesting. It really is. Uh, the typical rulership in this time period was either king or a chieftain. Uh, uh, oligarchy was very successful in, in Greece. And when I say in this time period, I mean the whole world. In the whole world, typically, most places are ruled by kings or king priests. Think about we talked about it with uh, China. Uh, India, uh, uh, Egypt, Mesopotamia. These were all places that were typically ruled by emperors, kings, stuff like this. These god kings ruling with the power of the gods. How is this both different and similar? Obviously, the I, ruling by representative government, democracy, ruling by thousands of people, uh, much different. Elected positions, you know, Pericles was elected to his position. He was chosen by the people, and they chose him year after year after year. So he had to be incredibly popular. Or he bribed a lot of people, also possible. Um, and, you know, so how's it also, how's it sort of similar and different from other types of ruling in the time period? You could find similarities and differences. Um, between this idea of Athens and the Athenian Empire and democracy. Because it's really weird. Within Athens, it was still democracy. But in this time period, outside of Athens, it was an empire. And an empire is where you overtake, subjugate, and dominate previously independent states. So within the city walls, we have a democracy. But outside of Athens, it's a 
it's like a military dictatorship almost. It, it's it's a uh, it's different. So to be an Athenian citizen meant one thing. Living in Athens, the city meant one thing. Living outside the city or being a non-Athenian meant a whole other thing. Uh, lots of stuff to think about there. Lots of good, lots of good questions or lots of good discussion stuff. All right. Daily life, social conditions in Athens. Typical house was small, usually had a couple rooms, usually a courtyard, maybe had a well, uh, an altar of some sort. Uh, most Greeks had their own family deities. There was lots of deities in the Greek pantheon of gods. Um, so they probably had their own worship. They do their own little rituals and, you know, maybe even their own animal sacrifices, maybe, possibly. Uh, most lived a very simple, austere, mater few material goods, a very, very plain life. These are even people who were who had status. Uh, it wasn't about material gain in this world. It really wasn't about that. People in town supported themselves as laborers or craftsmen. Uh, women might make metal items or baskets or clothes. Prostitution was common. Slavery was common. Um, Greek family was usually dominated by a male. Usually uh, a male. We're not to that hetero yet. I haven't got there yet. Usually dominated by a male and usually subservient women. Uh, boys were in charge when the father was away. Uh, women had little involvement in public affairs. Women didn't get to vote. They didn't get to participate in the democracy. Um, the democracy was just for the male citizens. Uh, and even then, for male citizens that had time on their hands, really, as we've talked about. Status was very restrictive. Women had few responsibilities and few rights. Uh, pretty much the entire rights or power of law, governing, Authority rested with the male head of household, uh, whoever that was at the time. And again, as even if the father was away, the son would then take priority typically. Uh, women, if they went to court, they had to have their husbands or fathers actually represent them. Uh, yeah. Uh, women certainly were very important, probably the most important role for women of reproduction, child care, raising children, or doing some side craft work. You know, making cloth on the side or making pottery on the side, maybe in their courtyard, for instance, to sort of help out uh, making some craft goods or something at home. Uh, only men and sons were, their, of course, their sons were real citizens. Prostitution was legal. Prostitution was legal, of, you know, pretty much in all early societies. It was common everywhere. Uh, sophisticated escorts, sophisticated prostitutes were often known as heterae. Ironically enough, these were the most social, the most educated, the most capable, and the wealthiest women were the hetero. They had independence, they had freedom, they didn't have to be married, have kids, they got to socialize with men. Any type of social gathering, women were not allowed, except for prostitutes. Now, hetero would be more like we would think of as an escort today, not necessarily for sex. Don't get me wrong, sex might have been part of the negotiation. Um, but hetero also would be without sex, where they were simply a associate when the man would go out because his wife didn't go. His wife would stay home, take care of the kids, take care of the family. The man would go out then with a basically an escort. This was standard practice for male citizens uh, in Athens, especially Athens. Uh, we see this. Um, really interesting. Really interesting. Same-sex relationships were also common. I think I mentioned that before. Uh, there was no term homosexuality in this time period. That is coined in modern times. So male-male relationships were normal and common. I mean, think about it this way. Um, do you want to have a relationship with someone who is uneducated, uh, knows nothing about law or politics, government, doesn't even know what's going on in the city, you want to have an intimate relationship with someone, or do you want to have this intimate relationship with someone who's knowledgeable, educated, um, who's on your level, who you can have an intelligent conversation with, who's well-read, who's seen the latest plays or read the latest documents, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the only ones who did that were men. Uh, so the most significant relationships outside of procreation that men had was with other men. Uh, and they often did involve sex. 
Uh, and even even with young boys, it was also common. It was also common to have sex with boys. There was no real there was no real rules on male sexuality in Greece, especially in, in places like Athens. They could pretty much have sex with whoever, whatever they wanted. The only thing literally off limits was married wives, other men's wives. That could get you in trouble. But other than that, you could pretty much stick your wick wherever you wanted. Um, women didn't have that same authority or, or um, authority, opportunity, or freedom. Uh, female same-sex relationships were not really allowed. Uh, a married wife would could be incredible amount of trouble if she ever was with another man. Um, yeah, uh, it was, a, it were, you know, to say a double standard is an incredible understatement, really. Uh, men could get away with a million times more than women could get away with in this society. Um, it was really interesting uh, what the men could do and get away with versus everyone else. Male citizenry in Athens was good. It was good to be a male citizen of Athens. You had all of the rights. You had all of the opportunities. And everyone else did not. Greek religion in this classic period. Greeks were polytheistic. I mean, that's obvious, I'm sure, at this point. They had lots of gods, lots of deities. And the deities really reflected humans. They were, uh, they looked like us. They talked like us. They were angry, petty, jealous, violent, happy. Uh, they lusted. They loved. They did everything humans did. They were really a total reflection of human society. That's how the gods were depicted and uh, described and written about, whether it is in philosophy or plays, drama, whatever. That's how the gods were seen. Um, like us, only with the power to basically do things gods could do, you know. Uh, they lived on Mount Olympus. You know, you have Zeus, who was the king of the gods. You have his wife, who was Athena. Uh, I believe it was his wife. Um, no, Hera was his wife, pardon me. Athena, I guess, was his daughter. Apollo was one of the gods. Many others, many other type, many other gods. Dozens, dozens of gods. Uh, all different ranks, too. The gods were all kinds of ranks, like military. You had the high gods, and you had middle gods, and lesser gods, and you have demigods. Demigods like Hercules and Achilles. These were half human, half god, which means one of their parents was a human. Um, to where one of the gods came down and got frisky with a human, usually through deception, where they would, you know, they would come down and, and look like the person's spouse and have sex with them. And then they'd be revealed afterwards, oh, I'm actually a god, and then you've just had sex with a god. And But that was seen as an honor if that happened, you know, because now your child was going to be half god, which made him powerful, immortal, able to do incredible feats of, of, of uh, like superheroes, you know, they could do anything. There was gods of war, fertility, love, poetry, athletic skill, literally a god for anything and everything. And many of these gods were personal family gods. Yeah. Uh, and as Greece expanded and grew and came into contact with other cultures in Africa and Asia, for instance, they would add more gods to the pantheon. They would actually expand and add more gods to it as they would, enc they would encounter new peoples and new cultures. Um... Achilles and Hercules, those are two of the demigods, those are half-gods. Really interesting. This is not religion like we think of as Christianity. You know, if you're familiar with Christianity or even Islam or Buddhism, this isn't like that, really. This is... Honestly, it could be mostly equated to business. Much of the relationships with gods was reciprocal, as a business is. You go into a store, you buy something, you give them money. It's reciprocal. You get an item, they get cash. Same thing really with the gods. The gods would supposedly give you blessings if you did a ritual for them. You did a sacrifice to them. You brought them a, milk, a, a, a jug of milk or a jug of honey or you burned some incense or you said the right words and cut open a, a goose and dropped blood there and did this and did that. It was transactional. Tit for tat. You do this and I do this. And it was often thought to be almost contractual, too. In other words, if I do this for you, you must give me blessings. You must make sure my child is born healthy. You must protect my husband when he's away at war or whatever. Um, it was more 
closely like a business than what we think of as classical, like, you know, if you're familiar with Christianity or Islam or something. Um, it was about purposes of the state. It was about purposes of, of making sure Greece was great and everything happened on time and worked out properly and everything got done that was supposed to be done. Um, really interesting. Really was. Uh, yeah. Uh, there really weren't any priests. There's a handful of priests or a little bit, but there was no think like clergy we think of today. Nothing, nothing is like clergy. Uh, a lot of religion was simply done yourself. You did your own rituals, did your own, so almost like everybody was clergy. Um, you were expected to go to these festivals. You were expected to attend ceremonies. But again, it was perfunctory. You did it because it was required, not because you wanted to. You did it because it was a transaction. If you showed up at the festival, you prayed on this day, you gave a sacrifice on this day at this time, the gods will bless you and take care of you. Just that simple. Um, yeah, there was no praying to some mysterious benevolence that you then may or may not ever get your prayer answered. Um, there was no idea of an afterlife. There was really no scriptures. There was no religious texts. If there was a religious text, it was literally just an instruction manual on how to do a ritual. Uh, it was like told you how to do a ritual, how to dip the blood here, how to pour the incense here, how to how to pour the milk over there. That's what it was. Real interesting stuff. Um, priests that did exist had no real power, no real status. That is different than almost all other cultures. In almost every other culture, priests held the highest status. Or the second highest. Greece? Not really. Anyone could read an instruction book. Literally, would you give someone high esteem who came in and showed you how to run your microwave? No. How do you run your microwave? You open up this little manual and you read the book and it tells you how to do it. You don't need a priest for that. It's really almost that simple. Um, really interesting kind of stuff. All kinds of religious festivals, activities. Um, think like the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games is actually a religious, really a religious festival. Lots of festivals. Athens had so many festivals. They almost had enough festivals to cover half the entire year. Yeah, there was almost like 250 or 150 or something like that festival days. A lot. Lots of festivals. That doesn't mean people took every day off, but still. Because, you know, we worship different gods. So, like, the, this festival we're having now might be if a certain god you have no interest in. Uh, they would have contests, music contests, literary competitions. Uh, yeah, like the men would go to the Olympics because they were male only. Well, except for hetero. They allowed prostitutes there. Uh, but the women might have a poetry competition, sort of similar, or a literary competition, sort of similar, for the handful of educated women, which would be maybe some elite women. Um, interesting stuff. Olympic, oh, the Pythian Games. That's the Pythian Games. That's the uh, musical literary competitions. The Pythian Games. I guess at the city of Pythia. These were held outside of Olympia. Uh, reason you get the term marathon for that 26.2 mile run. That was the run, I believe, from Olympia to the city of Marathon. Or the town of the city state of Marathon. It was at 26.2 miles. Or maybe there and back. Anyway, it has to do with the distance between and around marathon. That's why it's called a marathon. Interesting stuff. Now we get to one of the more significant things, like everything here is really significant when we're talking about Western civilization and Western culture, is philosophy. The flowering of philosophy, 5th century, 4th century BCE. We start with the pre-Socratics. We're going to spend time talking about Socrates, and so that's what these are. These are the Philosophers who came before Socrates, the pre-Socratics. Um, they were the first to move away from the gods and spirits to explain natural and supernatural phenomena. They were the first to really move away from gods and spirits as the answer to everything to explain natural and supernatural phenomena. Uh, from people getting sick, to comets in the sky, to earthquakes to heart attacks, to any number of things. Instead of everything being explained as, oh, it's the gods' will, the gods did it, you angered the gods, the gods are happy, 
they started to explain, you know, there might actually be other reasons than just the gods for why things happen that we don't understand or can't explain. In other words, just because there isn't an obvious explanation for why something occurs, the ground shakes, a uh, comet in the sky, your cow just falls over dead, there might be other reasons than simply a god decides to strike your cow dead, for instance. Um, really an attempt to explain things logically, to explain things rationally, using logic. Not blaming it on good or bad spirits or the gods. Democritus was one of the first. He really argued that all things in the world were made up of very, very small particles, which he called atoms. Um, thousands of years before we could see atoms. Thousands of years before we could actually see atoms and molecules with the naked eye or with, with, with naked eyes wrong, I guess, with, with instruments. Uh, he already theorizes that they exist. That all matter is made up of minuscule little, little particles that we can't see. Uh, and those are the atoms. Thousands of years before we could even begin to see them. Hippocrates, for instance, he's considered to be the father of medicine, the father of Western medicine. Even today, when you, you take the oath, the oath, the do no harm oath, uh, it's known as the Hippocratic Oath. He's the father of modern medicine, uh, or father of medicine, I guess. Maybe not modern medicine. What made him so different? Pretty much all medicine people before this, or what we think of as more like shamans, they dealt with spirits and the gods and, you know, the energies of people and essences and all this kind of stuff. He actually used chemicals and physical treatments to treat sick people. Medicine. Uh, not prayers, not rituals, not sacrificing a, uh, a goat. He actually uh, did surgeries, opened up the human body. He actually charted out internal parts of the human body, organs and, and whatnot. Actually drew like um, diagrams of the human body from cadavers. Uh, and really believe that people were sick or ill or hurt due to something wrong with the body. In other words, not external, but entirely internal. Something was wrong with the body that caused the body not to function right and caused you to get ill, for instance. He was the first to really do this and talk about this. These are just a couple of examples. There's lots of them. There's lots of people. There's, a, there's, you know, there's a lot we could talk about. So these are just a couple of examples. The next group of philosophers we'll talk about are the Sophists. Um, the Sophists were around the same time, around the same time as the pre-Socratics. They taught in Athens, primarily. They were intellectuals, and they spent most of their time not thinking about the natural world, but about politics, about government. They questioned the laws, they speculated about politics, they questioned the rulers, and they really, they really challenged how society was run and debated how society should be run. Uh, they charged a fee for their teachings and they taught oratory. Probably the most important art for a lawyer, simply the art of speaking. And not just speaking, but being convincing. In other words, persuasive speaking. That's what lawyers do for a living, about persuasive speaking. They were criticized because they did actually take payments. Some of these people, like sophists, did a lot of their stuff for free. Uh, some did, some did not. But some sophists, who, who were basically orators, they actually would charge a fee, almost like a, like a tutor, almost. Uh, some people said they shouldn't do this. Almost like swindlers or a huckster. They use their impressive verbal skills to trick people, deceive people. Really what pissed people off was the fact that these guys were smarter and they really thought deeper than anyone else. And they would charge some money for it. How dare you charge money just to talk about ideas or thoughts or to give advice. Um, but some of them did. And this leads us to Socrates, no longer the pre-Socratics. We move to the Socratic guy himself, Socrates. 
Socrates got himself in a lot of trouble. Like the sophists, he questioned Athenian traditions. He questioned Athenian laws. And he believed fully that the Athenian leadership was driven and motivated by greed. Greed in their wars with Sparta, the Peloponnesian War, for instance. Greed in their wars with uh, Persia, even. Um, driven by greed, they were power hungry. That's how he saw it. He used what's often referred to as a Socratic method to teach and to prove that even those that were educated thought they knew everything, were experts in their field, really weren't. Um, usually proving that people really didn't know what they were talking about. Um, it's a question and answer method, where every time someone gives you an answer, you question that answer. And every time you delve deeper. In other words, every time you say something, they question that. And then you give an answer in response to that, and they say, well, okay, well, you said that. How do you know that? How do you know that? It would be like today, you hear people always say this, I say it, we all do. Oh, you know, they say this, or they did this study, or they did that, or uh, they think this. You know, you see it on the news, you hear people talk about it, we say it. You know, as, as professors, you know, everyone says it. Socrates wouldn't be okay with that. He'd be like, who is they? Where's your proof? Where's your evidence? How do you know? And then if you were like, try to answer and say who they are, he'd be like, how do they know? How, where's their proof? Where's their evidence? And Socrates would not stop until finally you had to admit, I don't know. I don't know. And the Socrates would say, <clears throat> that's my point. You really don't know. No matter what you think you know, ultimately you really don't know. You don't know what you think you, you know. You know? <laughs> that's sort of the way it was. Um, of course, this caused conflict, pissed a lot of people off. Um, simply challenging government leadership is enough to get you in trouble. Going out around and proving to people that most of them are dumb and don't really know the truth about anything, even though we thought they did. He also challenges preconceived ideas to where, you know, prejudices and intolerance, and he challenges those things. No one is really safe from him. And further, he would also teach, he was one of these guys that would teach by walking around, and people would just follow him. So he'd just walk around, and people would follow, and he would just talk, and he would just meet random people and question them on the streets. Uh, eventually, he's arrested and charged with um, corrupting the youth. Seems to be the real reason is he was challenging the authority of, of Athens, really. Uh, yeah. He was tried and found guilty of this corruption of the youth, and he was given an opportunity to actually leave Athens. Exile. That's what they did for the elite. The upper-class people, the uh, important people, could simply leave. He chose to stay, and if he chose to stay, he had to die. He had to commit suicide. So he drank hemlock poison. Killed himself. Uh, it was either that or leave. Uh, and he did it to, uh, he was willing, someone willing to die for his beliefs. How many of us can say that? Not many. His student, oh, I'm sure he had many students, but one of his more prominent students was Plato, 427, 347. He focused on his own philosophy, he focused on philosophy of justice, issues of justice. Uh, he said we had to look and strive for perfect forms. What does it really mean? It's kind of complicated. Let's just say that he believed there was a perfect form of everything. Perfect form of government, perfect form of love, perfect form of virtue. None of us can ever achieve it. But you should always strive to be to achieve it. Today in our society, we might say, you know, be a better person, be better you. His went much further than that. He really believed there was this perfect you, this perfect form of everything. No one could ever achieve it, but you should always be trying to get there should always be on the path to get to perfection. The world we see, the world that is imperfect, the one that we deal with on a daily basis, our friends, our jobs, everybody, our family, that's an imperfect world. It's flawed, imperfect, and ugly. The perfect world, though, the world of forms, is invisible. We should always work towards it, 
but you never get there. This is what sometimes referred to as metaphysics, which is sort of spiritual physics, if you will. Um, anyway, uh, it wasn't all a popular people. He did actually form a school, though, the academy, and I think. I think this is the one that lasted for 900 years. I don't have that in my notes, but it was a school of philosophy and learning. Uh, it was effectively a university, an early university, and um, it survived for well into the Roman age uh, before it was finally defeated. I think it actually survives to the fall of Rome, 400s, 500s. Uh, a student of Plato was Aristotle. Most people have read Aristotle. He also taught Alexander the Great, for instance. He was a teacher. Um, he focused on this. His was on the concept of purpose. Believing everything has a purpose. And that the only way you know the purpose of things is by closely observing, studying, experimenting on. He even said there's a purpose to everything. Literally a grain of sand on a beach. Art, poetry, architecture, every single thing, every tree, every hair, every whatever. Every single thing that exists has a purpose. Interesting. How do you know this? Let's say it differently. How do you know the purpose? You know it through observation. You know it through logic. Through careful study. Experimentation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you have to observe the world around you. Very interesting stuff. Oh, let's go back up to that. Okay. Let's go back. There we go. All right. I'm sorry it's covered by the picture. It's kind of weird. I don't know why it's like that, but I'm not going to take time to fix it now. Aristotle, observation, uh, analysis, and uh, careful study, I think, is, is what it is. Let's try it again. Reasoning. There it is. Observation, analysis, and reasoning. What's another pain? Eh, I could edit all it out, but I'm all right. It's kind of like a real class. You know, you just got to deal with the shit when it comes. You got to roll with it. Why not? Observation, analysis, reason, using logic, using intelligence. Um, these three intellectuals, philosophers, intellectuals, uh, even, even sometimes were referred to as natural philosophers, especially Aristotle. Natural philosophy is usually the early term given to what today we call science. So Aristotle might have actually been the earliest scientist. Again, a lot of the stuff Socrates and Plato talk about is metaphysical, but Aristotle was much more down to earth. He believed in experimentation, analysis, observation, reasoning, logic. Um, yeah. In essence, you can really understand everything in the world. If you study and observe how it reacts with the world around, it's natural philosophy or science. These three philosophers, and don't get me wrong, there's lots of others. These are just the big ones, the biggest ones. These three philosophers really, they might have been together the most influential on Western thought, government, science, philosophy, for probably the next two millennia. Really. Uh, we still, we still talk about these. These are still taught in school. The Socratic method and Aristotle. Uh, what these men did, you know, can't ever really be, uh, can't be overstated. They did so much, really. Hellenistic society. Hellenistic, 336 to 100. We call this the Hellenistic period because it's the blending of Eastern culture. Think Persia. Indian, Middle Eastern, and Western culture, European, Mediterranean. We owe this blending really to Philip of Macedon and his son, Alexander the Great. 
you know, it's interesting. We talk so little about women, uh, women with authority, women with power, women who had prestigious positions. You know, we don't talk about female philosophers. There's almost no evidence. There's almost no evidence of female intellectuals in, in the entire of Greek history. Whether this is because men so devalued women's contributions that they simply didn't write about it, didn't let it be written down, or whether women simply weren't allowed to be educated. And so they literally couldn't be intellectuals because they were not allowed to be educated. It's probably a mixture because we know there is some evidence of a couple of female playwrights, a female poet. There's a little bit of evidence of that. So it seems that most women were not given opportunities for education. And the handful that were, we only have a few extant items, you know, items that still exist, only a handful of items that still exist for these women. Uh, again, probably because they just weren't seen as important. Because you also need to understand, if I didn't make it clear before, a lot of what we have left over from ancient history is not original. Most of what we have to look over is not original. You know, we don't have original uh, plays of these Greek writers, usually. What we have is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. That's what we have. The original works of most of this stuff does not exist. I mean, there's exceptions, but a lot of it doesn't. So what we have is where someone at some time in later history has to deemed it worthy of saving and preserving and copying it over and over, etc. So this the women's being lost to intellectual history, as is much of the world, may be as much a result as them not being given opportunities as later intellectuals simply devaluing women's work or considering it not important. You know, some monk sitting in a monastery in the 5th century CE, looking over some document. And here's such and such Greek document written by a Greek philosopher who's a man, and this one is written by a woman. You know, if they could even tell. But maybe, this is, suppose it has their name on it, they can tell. And then that monk just simply deciding, I'm not going to worry about copying the woman, I'm just going to do the man's. Because, you know, we value men over women. Women are really devalued in some later parts of European society. Women have no status. They're, they're treated as second-class subordinate uh, subjects to men or to society. So, yeah, it's really interesting, um, the causes for this. Uh, it's probably a mixture of everything, truthfully. But nonetheless, bottom line, we have very, very little intellectual evidence of women from early world history anywhere very little of it even if it was there in the first place it just doesn't survive anymore it's a real shame it really is uh no doubt women would have had the love the opportunity and some women probably did have the opportunity to do and excel just as much as men and yeah, really, it's a digression. I'm, I apologize for all that. But really, it's really important to say, I think, when you look at all the things we've been talking about and all these men's names and men, 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 and we don't even mention women. There's reasons for that. Uh, we can really only talk about what we have evidence of. And we have very scarce evidence of women in any of these things, unfortunately. Uh, Hellenistic society moving on. The polis to monarchy. The 30-year Peloponnesian War we talked about, it really weakened Athens. It really weakened Sparta, the rest of the Greeks. It left all of the Greek city-states weak and vulnerable. And to the north, Philip of Macedon took advantage of this. First Philip I, he starts conquering uh, northern Greece in the mid-300s, 350s, 360s. Then his son comes along, Philip II, and Philip II continues conquering northern Greece, actually getting some Greek city-states to ally with him. And so he also then learns the tactics of the Greeks, which makes them so effective. Their hoplite warfare, um, I think they use chariots and archers and all this kind of stuff. 
And so using Greek tactics, he actually learns and trains his men, in addition to using Greek soldiers, to then turn the tables on the other Greeks. And so even before Alexander comes to power, Philip I and Philip II are already conquering, making alliances with northern Greeks. Now, they're from Macedonia, which is really in Europe. I mean, even on Greece is Europe, but Greece is sort of this peninsula, which is sort of separate from European culture. Macedonians are this buffer. Macedonians thought little of the Greeks. They thought of themselves as Greek, but they disrespected the actual Greeks who lived south of them. Uh, they thought they were weak. The Macedonians were warrior peoples. They were real warriors. They were more like the classic Greeks, constantly fighting in civil war and aggression. I mean, you look down at Athens now, and it's a bunch of guys walking around in white robes all day long, uh, philosophizing, is that even a word, in the streets, walking around with young boys, following around, taking notes, or whatever the hell they did back then. Um, so many people in Macedonia, which is still a real warrior society, look down upon Athens, look down upon it. It's become, they've become weak um, in many eyes of the Macedonians. And Philip I and Philip II took advantage of this. Uh, he really wins control of Greece. And one of the ways he wins control of Greece is by... Um, this is interesting. Actually, let me to make a correction here. This Philip here of Macedon is actually Philip II, I believe. And then Philip the One was before him. How do they get so many Greeks to turn on Greece and join Macedonia? Some of it is the military conquest, but much of it is by using their fears of the Persians against them. They convince the Greeks that if you join with Macedonia, we will go and defeat the Persians in the name of Greece. Join us. And we will help you defeat your eight. I mean, they, by this point in time, the Greeks have been fighting the Persians for 300 years on and off. So you join us. We will help you defeat your most ancient of all enemies. The one enemy that at times has united all Greeks. The true evil in the world. The Persians. Um, and it works. He either conquers, subjugates, or allies himself with most of northern Greece, getting a slew of city-states to join him, all believing they are working towards a common goal of defeating Persia. He spent 20 years of warfare conquering and taking uh, northern Greece until he finally dies in 36. Uh, probably, probably assassinated, maybe by a Persian spy, maybe by his own son. Not uncommon back then to kill off daddy because you were tired of waiting for him to go off and die in war. So just get it over with. And we think he was poisoned, maybe. Nonetheless, immediately Alexander rises to power, takes over, kills all of the generals of Philip, kills all the generals, kills their families. These are his own people. So he rises to power, kills anyone who's a friend or ally of Philip, his father and consolidates all power in Greece under himself. Definitely a megalomaniac and arrogant. Um, however, he does actually hold to his word, or to his father's word. He then wages war against the Persians, what they had been promising for 20 plus years. Finally, uniting Greece, using the Greek, Greek hoplites and, and Greek military tactics, they actually go on the offensive and they attack and they invade into Persia. Me immediately, Alexander sets to, to be good on his word and conquer the great enemy of all Greeks, the Persians. First, he takes Egypt, takes over northern Egypt. Uh, he gets himself named as the pharaoh of Egypt. Of course, that's the leader, the king of Egypt. Uh, he then uh, builds Alexandria. Uh, right on, I think it's right on the Mediterranean, which at one point is actually the largest city in the world. So for a while, after uh, Alexander builds this, and Alexandria meaning the city of Alexander, he builds a, over a dozen Alexandrias, by the way. Everywhere he goes, he builds these cities, or has it built. Alexandria becomes this great city, eventually becomes a huge uh, power in uh, Egypt, I believe in Egypt. 
Also, we see the largest library in the world is here. We see the great, uh, the great lighthouse, the Pharos, I think it's called, lighthouse, which was one of the wonders of the ancient world. The library was a wonder. Um, no one knows for sure, but some historians have suggested that the library at Alexandria might have had half a million copies of documents. I guess they would have been on papyrus maybe or something. Half a million documents. All lost. Because when the Romans conquered Alexandria, they burned the library. As far as we know, everything in the library was lost, or most of it was lost. Potentially the greatest repository of ancient history ever that has ever existed in the world. All gone, burned to the ground because of those damn Romans. Uh, maybe there were more documents in the Library of Alexandria than all other ancient documents combined. All combined in that one location. Um, yeah, to even imagine for a moment what history we would have if that library had never been destroyed. It's unbelievable to think about the amount of knowledge that was lost. Um, yeah, nonetheless, it happened. Uh, he moved east after that. He defeated uh, the uh, Persians at Persepolis. That was the capital of Persia. So in a matter of about four years, he conquers Persia. The largest, greatest, wealthiest empire in the world at the time. Not, not just Europe, not just Asia. The world greater than anything is in India or China or Africa anywhere. It, it covered most of South Central Asia, um, Southwestern Asia, uh, incredibly wealthy, powerful, had now existed by this time period for four or five hundred years. He conquers them in four years. Pretty, pretty crazy, really. He moves east, he goes all the way, takes, uh, takes much of the Western Asia, pushes all the way into the Indus River Valley in India, invades India, uh, he fights war elephants there, and he barely wins that battle. And then his soldiers rebel against him, uh, they mutiny, they force him to return home, he charts a course heading back towards Greece, a very circuitous course, he doesn't go directly, continues fighting, heads back towards Greece, gets to Babylon, which is in Mesopotamia, and he dies there. Never, never getting anywhere near Greece again. We don't know what killed him. No one knows. Lots of speculation. Uh, he might have been killed by one of his generals. Not surprising. That happens. Uh, he also was known as a, a heavy drinker and partier with lots of women, even though he was married with a, with a son, I think. Uh, so he might have had a VD of some sort. Uh, alcohol poisoning, liver cirrhosis, who the hell knows? No one knows exactly what, what killed him, but nonetheless, he dies. And again, he, maybe he was assassinated as well. No one really knows. Uh, this is in the Arabian Peninsula, Mesopotamia, where he dies. After his death, his family is uh, executed. They kill his family. Again, not uncommon. They kill his wife, his mother, and his child. Uh, murder all of them. His generals do. Because they want his empire, they want the the tre I mean, the treasure and wealth he accumulated is un unknown or incalculable. He took all the treasure of Egypt, three thousand year old uh, empire. He took all the treasure of Persia, five hundred year old empire, which had conquered Mesopotamia and other places. He took treasures from Western India. He conquered all of Greece, all of Ionia. He would have been. If there was any way to calculate it, he would have been the wealthiest person in the world, by far. And so when he died, his generals pretty much just scrambled to take it all, take it all over, can take everything and control everything. The three generals were Antigonus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus that rose to the top. These three managed to eliminate all rivals, either kill, execute, or uh, subjugate all rivals. They take his massive empire and divide it up into thirds. Uh, we get the Antigonid Empire, which is in uh, Greece and Ionia. We get the Ptolemaic Empire, which is Egypt. And then we get the Seleucid Empire, which was what was Persia, uh, is the Seleucid Empire. So Alexander's great empire he created lasted all of about three years. Around 326 is when he's forced to turn back from India. 
He dies three years later, and immediately his empire is divvied up between his generals. Greatest empire the world's ever known. Square mile-wise, influence-wise, last three years. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Ptolemy took over the title of Pharaoh, of course, because he began ruling Egypt, uh, which leads, of course, to the final Pharaoh on the Ptolemaic line, which is uh, Cleopatra. So she's a descendant of Ptolemy. Uh, she's the last Ptolemaic Pharaoh before Rome conquers Egypt. Really interesting stuff. I could spend the whole class just studying, studying what Alexander did. So there we got the three empires. We have Alexander's empire. Oh no, here we go. This is this is his empire growing. Sorry, Alexander's empire in 332, Greece, Asia Minor, Egypt. By 330, he had conquered uh, Western Persia. By 326, he had conquered all of this, uh, all of uh, South Central Asia, all the way to the edge of India, the Indus River Valley. Then he gets turned around. You can see all these cities he founded. There's dozens of cities he founded. It's all the way around. And then dies somewhere. I guess it's down here in Mesopotamia. That's where he dies. Somewhere in this area. Or Babylon. There's Babylon right there. And the last thing we'll talk about. We'll end the chapter with this. Okay, he only had an empire for three years. That really is, is insignificant. That's nothing. It is something. Matter of fact, it's a huge something. As Alexander went, he spread the Greek culture everywhere he went. He founded Greek cities all across the known world at the time. He relocated, forcibly relocated Greeks by the tens of thousands from Greece to all these places. So we have Greek citizens living in India. Uh, Africa, Central Asia, all the way to the edge of China, Bactria, the edge of China. I mean, most of them, I mean, there's no way they're going home. They're relocated as part of Alexander's armies, and now they live 3,000, 5,000 miles from home. They're going back. So they stayed there. They settled down. So this culture, it's really what we call this Hellenism, the spread of the Greek culture caused by Alexander's conquests. What Alexander does, <clears throat> more than anything, is opens up conduits for the transmission of Greek culture to the whole rest of the world. Don't know that that was his intention. Who knows? It's what it does, though. It allows Greek ideas and Western ideas to infiltrate all across Afro-Eurasia. Likewise. It allows those influences, which are often referred to as Near East influences, to move westward into Europe and Greece. We see this exchange of ideas, this exchange of culture, exchange of religions, exchange of science, exchange of everything. East West. This is what Alexander this is probably Alexander's most significant accomplishment. Maybe something he never had any intention of doing. Or had causing to happen, but probably is. Um, and we call this Hellenism, the spread of this Greek culture across this vast Afro Eurasian area. Uh, again, he, he conquered cities, he settled new Greek settlements, he often allowed his soldiers to retire wherever they were at. So if they were in the middle of Asia and his soldier got to retirement age and survived his battles, he would simply let him retire. Uh, set up set up shop in one of the local towns um, and start a family with a local person. And that was now where the Greek culture, they would build temples, they would build theaters, they would build public baths, they would start building construction projects that looked like Greeks. Because Alexander had tons of money, so he spent all the money. He, he gave the money out. He, was, he wasn't a hoarder. He gave the money out as he made it, as he would loot treasuries of kings and he would then give the money to the people. People loved him, generally. Um, once I got over the fact that he'd just come in and, you know, burned half the city and killed half their population, then they loved him. Uh, 
So they would build, they would use this money to build Greek architectural projects. And so we have evidence of Greek cities 8,000 miles from Greece. Pretty crazy. We see this Greek tradition blending with all these local indigenous cultures. And we see cities thousands of miles from Greece having all the elements of a Greek city. Government, theaters, Greek language even spoken. We have an evidence of Greek language being spoken. Um, these, citizen, these cities often granted citizenship to Hellenized natives, which actually allowed local peoples to become Greek, learn Greek, become citizens, get to vote, stuff like this. Um, making people of India and the Middle East actual Greek citizens. Uh, this is mostly in the cities, and that should be noted. Most of this that is occurring is in the cities. In the countryside, life doesn't change much. If you're an indigenous person in India speaking the local language, you probably didn't suddenly start speaking Greek and going to a Greek theater. So the cities, the urban areas, were Hellenized. The rural areas, which is still most places, wasn't really Hellenized um, to any serious extent. It was the educated, the middle and upper class, um, the other intellectuals, the merchants, the politicians. These are the people that really sort of absorbed the Hellenistic culture and spread it. And many of them actually start speaking a new language we call Koine or Common became the language of law, government, politics, of the elite. Uh, Hellenistic cities became centers of commerce and culture. And this Koine was a blending of indigenous languages and uh, traditional Greek language. A great example is in Bactria, the city of Iconum. This is a picture of the ruins of city of Iconum, excavated ruins by archaeologists where they've dug it all out, cleaned it all out. You can see all the structure of the walls. You can see structures left, fireplaces. Uh, you can see where the walls were, the doors were. This was a city in Bactria. Bactria is on the edge of China, some 8,000 miles or almost 8,000 miles from Greece. And that's as the crow flies. Imagine actually traveling there by the routes. I mean, it's, I'm sure, 10,000 miles more. Um, this city combined all kinds of elements of Hellenism, the Greek culture blended with Asian and uh, Central Asian culture, all the way to the edge of China and India. It was an independent kingdom that came into power, uh, probably out of the Seleucid. The Seleucid, remember, that was the remainder of Alexander that sort of covered the Persian. So Bactria is probably a piece of that, sort of breaks off, eventually becomes the independent kingdom. Um... It was nestled between the Middle East, China, and India, and Russia, but it was built on the entire Greek model. Greek public square, Greek architecture for its buildings, Greek temples, Greek theaters. It was, for all intents and purposes, a Greek city thousands of miles from Greece. People probably spoke Greece, spoke Greek, some of them, but they also probably spoke local languages to them. I spoke to Kone. Um, there's evidence, another thing, I think this is the one that has what's called Wall Street, and don't, don't quote me on this, I'm actually thinking about something out in my notes, but I believe this was the city, called Wall Street. It was called that simply because it was lined with walls, that's why. Well, this city, or, or one of these cities like it, was found, one of them was found with 12 different temples or religious stations if you will, to where it's obvious that at least, and they've all been dated to the same time period. So simultaneously in this city, there was at least 12 different deities worshiped in the city. That means something, folks. That shows an extreme level of tolerance and acceptance, diversity, because if you got 12 different religions worshiped, you probably have a lot of different people different ethnic groups, different languages, different cultures, all living in the same, we would, we would probably call a cosmopolitan city. Pretty crazy, really. That only happened because of what Alexander did. Now, I'm not saying Alexander was a good guy. He was a brutal. He was a warrior. He was a conqueror. 
he killed who knows how many, many how many people. Um, but his spreading the Hellenism really allowed East and West to meet, really allowed Eastern and Western cultures to thrive and work off of each other, uh, and both to benefit. This is a metal plate from Iconum. Um, even though the city was situated very far from Greece, uh, pretty much on the, today it's the modern border of Russia and Afghanistan, the Hellenistic rulers brought with them all kinds of elements of Greek culture. All right. One thing, the head of the sun god, the head of the sun god resembles a glass, a classic Greek face and head with the, with the curly hair. Classic Greece. Uh, the clothing of the goddess, one of the goddess here is Sibylle, I think. This is the goddess. She represents, she is a Middle Eastern goddess, and yet she's got Greek clothing on her. She's draped as though she is a Greek, even though she's a Middle Eastern god. Uh, this this culture of this Hellenistic kingdom of Bactria, where Aconum was located, it was what we call syncretic. Syncretic. In other words, it blends two different religious cultures, and it's actually much more than that. I'll say it differently then. It blends multiple religious cultures and sort of forms a new culture. That's this blending of this. Maybe Indian, Persian cultures with Greek culture. Uh, there's elements in here which are not Greek. Uh, the prominent location here of the sun god. That is unusual. Um, it shows influence over Greek peoples because it's thought to be Greek peoples. So it shows the god up here over. Um, you got to consider who was the head of Greek culture. It wasn't the sun god. It was actually Zeus. So here we have the head of the gods in this picture not being Zeus, being someone else. Uh, and the sun god's name is Helios. This was not the Greek head, and yet this shows the head gods here, the chief god being the sun god, which is not Zeus. That's an interesting blending of culture. Quite interesting. Another thing to think about, how does this really change from previous Greek culture? Gods weren't given all that much authority or power. As long as you did the rituals and followed the prayers, gods really had no power other than what you gave them through your contracts, through your negotiations, if you will, your rituals. Really interesting. It really is. All right. And the last thing is just the trade. This idea of how this Afro-Eurasian culture really influenced trade between East and West, commerce, business. Uh, Alexander, he expanded his empire. He took over treasures from those he conquered. Uh, he, he, he looted massive amounts of gold and silver and gems and all kinds of stuff. This allowed him to build a large road system. He also built a very large road system, um, better than the Persian roads. This allowed lots of trade to really move faster and more efficiently, which facilitated trade even further. Um, this really creates what we sometimes refer to as the ancient Silk Roads. In essence, the trade routes which connected China with Europe or the Mediterranean. Carrying all these luxury goods, gold, silver, spices, they carried slaves as well. But we also know there were water routes too. A lot of these trade routes didn't go across land. They would carry these big, um, these big urns. They would carry with them, and they'd be filled with oil or grain or whatever. We still find these in the Middle Mediterranean, even sealed. There were some found not very long ago. These big, these big things that are like four foot, six feet high. I actually, found some bottom of the Mediterranean Ocean still filled with wine. Hmm. Everyone talks about like like the most expensive wine is like the aged wine, like the wine that's twenty or thirty years old or something. Wonder how much you get for two thousand five hundred year old wine. I'm thinking it's probably not any good anymore. Nonetheless, we still find them sealed at the bottom of the ocean with the wax seals on top. Pretty crazy. Uh, yeah. 
lots and lots of places that had no connections with each other now did, never had connections before, now they do as a result of Alexander's Hellenism. The roads he built, the trade he facilitated, the cities he built, plus that Koine language. So many now people speak a, a more of a common language that everybody can speak, that most people understand. That, of course, how do you trade with someone you can't communicate? So now that you can communicate, you have a common language, boom. You can trade, make deals, negotiations, make contracts, bills of sale, you name it, the list goes on. Can't do that if we can't communicate. If my paper is written in one language, yours written in another, we are going to be wrong on a paper yet, but whatever it is they're using. It's a big deal. Uh, wood, food, grain, metal, olive oil, silver, gems, spices, um, you know, raw materials, manufactured goods, slaves. I think I talked about all that. Yeah. This growth of trade and commerce makes many, many people wealthy and really helps places expand. Because if you don't have enough food to feed your people, you simply buy food from someone else. You don't have the right food. A plague hits your city. You don't have medicines or some type of treatment for the plague. You buy it from the trade routes. You don't have enough slaves to build a monument. You buy it from the trade routes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Trade routes also had a negative thing, too, because, you know, what else spreads? Disease, infection. Also, war. When you have really good roads, armies can move faster. They can march faster. Better communication, too. And communication is really good for fighting war and conflict. So it actually gives you an advantage even there. That's one of the reasons Alexander built the roads. He wanted his army to be able to move faster. He got that. Conquered a great part of the world in, you know, 300 years. Pretty impressive. Well, that sort of brings us to the end of the Greek experience up to, you know, the 100s CE, pardon me, BCE. Really does bring us up to that. Now, your book goes on a little further and talks a little bit more about science and medicine and philosophy in the new Hellenistic world. I'm not going to go into that. I'm not going to talk about Epicureanism or Stoicism or anything like that. You, you can. Again, it's in your book. It's uh, section five or six. Five in the book. This is section four. Talks a little bit more about religion, philosophy, and science and medicine. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I think I've covered plenty. I've already gone a little longer than I planned. So hopefully you enjoyed it. I think it's it's really it's a really great overview of Greece. And this is an overview class. This is a community college class. It's meant to just to be an overview. You really want to study Greece? I welcome it. You should do it. But uh, you know you need it at the university, and then you can take class after class after class on Greece. Good luck. Um, anyway. Thanks for sitting through it with me. Take care, and uh, we will see you next week.